Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. It's my pleasure this afternoon to be able to introduce Dr. Jay Apt, who is, uh, and, uh, all of his accomplishments have, um, are very long, so I'm not going to give a long introduction to Dr. Apt. However, he is uh, a noted expert on the energy issues, which you'll hear about today, and he worked closely with Dr. Lester Lave, and he holds an undergraduate degree from Harvard and a doctorate from MIT in experimental physics. He was also one of uh, an astronaut in 1985 and spent more than 35 days in space. He has been uh, has many achievement awards, and so I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Apt. Thank you, Janice. I'm a uh, tenured professor at Tepper. I teach a bunch of MBA courses, and um, specifically what Janice didn't mention, which is quite relevant to this, is that uh, I run the Carnegie Mellon Electricity Industry Center here. It's the largest interdisciplinary group anywhere in the world studying the electric power sector. Uh, Tepper and uh, Carnegie Mellon in general have become justly famous for our interdisciplinary work. And the work that I'm uh, proud to have um, been associated with at the Electricity Industry Center is the best in the world. There is nobody who even comes close to us because it is inherently interdisciplinary and we uh, have that as a huge competitive advantage here at CMU. So, um, I, Jenna said I was an astronaut in 1985. It was actually uh, between 1985 and 1997, uh, and I flew on the space shuttle four times. And so, in an audience where I'm talking about uh, uh, energy, I generally tell people I'm the only one in the group who owes their life to fuel cells and solar arrays. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the things that uh, we consider with energy and with some emphasis on some of our world-class research on uh, low carbon electric power, but only a little bit of it because I've only got a little bit of time and I want to leave some time for questions. Um, I had a wonderful experience yesterday talking to about uh, 20 uh, folks who fund energy work, J.P. Morgan, uh, Chase, all, all the folks, uh, they happen to be in Pittsburgh, they fund um, generally bond issues for both municipalities who want to get into energy uh, and companies who are doing this. And they were delighted to hear about the work that we do here at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon. They, they were uh, just blown away by it. And again, it's because of the competitive advantage we have being interdisciplinary. Okay, so enough of that. Um, let me entertain you a little bit today. Uh, probably better if I actually plug this in here, wouldn't it be? Yeah, there we go. Let's see if that works. Um, usually I have to get out and then get it back in. Right. There we are. All right, so I'm going to give you uh, a bit of background on energy trends. Just global large trends, uh, and then talk to you a little bit about our renewable electricity work. And hopefully in the question period, if people want to ask about uh, the shale gas stuff, where we're kind of ground zero of one of the four large uh, shale gas plays, I can talk about that as well. And again, I'm not speaking to you ex cathedra. I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm just going to give you some results of our research uh, to help you when you think about energy issues, right? Okay. So first of all, global trends. Let's see if we can cut the lights back just a little bit. Um, cut this down to about here, maybe I'll work. That's better. Um, so this is from 1971 till 2009. Uh, and here is the increase in coal. I heard somebody whisper in the back that this is China. That's absolutely correct. Um, Oil about steady, natural gas gone up, uh, nuclear gone up over the period but stable in the last decade or so. Look at this very large sector, wood and waste. This is global energy use. What is most of that? Wood. Yeah, wood. Well, that's good. That's good. So how do they use it? How do they use it? 
Cooking, exactly. Yeah. Cooking and heating. Sure. Cooking and heating. And uh, it's just, it's an enormous piece of the, uh, of the pie here, which most people forget about entirely. Here's hydroelectric stuff. And this little thing about the width of the line up there uh, is what we often talk about as renewables. Okay. You see diagrams like this where the, the um, inputs and outputs are like this. And people do this for the United States and so forth. And you can spend lots of time looking through these things and say, well, most of the coal goes to electricity generation. A little bit uh, is used as industrial feedstocks. Most of the petroleum goes to transport, but uh, some portion of it is, again, used for industrial feedstocks. And that's fine. And people give whole hour talks on this kind of stuff. That's not what I'm going to do today. You can look this stuff up. You don't need a talking head to do that for you. Right. OK. What I'm going to tell you about is that things like that are just snapshots in time, and they're not actually good representations of either how you can make money in business or how you have to react. Because these transitions happen a lot. There's lots of folks in my business who say, energy transitions happen very slowly. And let me give you the arguments for that. Uh, here is the energy consumption in the United States in units that don't matter for specialists. They're quadrillion British thermal units, but they don't matter. The 1800s was the century of wood, right? It really was in the United States. Coal came in late. Uh, and then the 1900s were you know, either coal or petroleum, depending on how you integrate. But look at the time scales that these go up with, and we'll talk about more. It's a couple of generations, you know, 30, 40 years uh, that these transition. Here's nuclear again, going up over about 30 years, okay? Um, in the United States, energy production is also subject to transitions of the order of a generation or two. You hear about peak oil. Who hasn't heard about peak oil? Yeah. Well, peak oil in the United States actually occurred. Here is the production of crude oil in the United States, and it peaked in about more or less 1970. But notice a couple of things. First of all, it didn't drop off to nothing. In fact, it's on its way back up now. Second of all, it's not symmetric around the peak at all. In fact, it's grossly not symmetric. Those of you who are interested in peak oil may have heard about Edwin Hubbard and the Hubbard curve, right? The Hubbard curve was wrong even for the US. When you look at the integral under the curve, Hubbard was wrong by about a factor of pi, okay? Factor of three. And, and completely nonsensical for uh, outside the US. Um, natural gas peaked, went down, and went back up for a couple of reasons. One is that we uh, had price controls in the 70s that did not incentivize people to look for natural gas at all. Coal's been pretty steadily going up with cyclical variation and so forth. Pretty much uh, stable now and actually going down a bit. Nuclear again went up. And all of that you know, goes along with the theories that say it takes about one, two generations to have an energy transition. And there's a lot of truth in that. But it's not absolute. Um, this is what I've said, you know, it took about 50 years for Pennsylvania oil fields up, up here to when it became 10% of the total and then another 30 years to go from 10 to 25%. Natural gas took 70 years to go from 1 to 20%. Nuclear took a quarter of a century to reach 10%. Car ownership in the U.S. took uh, two generations uh, and 75 years in the EU between the introduction when half the families had an automobile, right? So Vakov Schmiel, who's a friend of mine, goes uh, and, and writes books and says, you know, energy transitions are very, very slow. And generally, that's true. But what's generally true isn't specifically true. Even in the time of this graph, we had a transition from whale oil to kerosene that took three years. Coal for generation of electric power in this country has gone down from um, close to 60%, 57%, to about 40% in four years. Right? And so occasionally you get very, very rapid transitions. Now, I don't want to say that this is wrong. It does take a long time for 
huge introductions to take place. But I want you to keep in mind that occasionally you reach transitions that are much faster uh, than the medians ones. Okay. Right. All right. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the second thing, which is electric power, my specialty, um, trends and pressures for change. This is world electricity consumption. And it's going up at about 3% per year. That is to say, it doubles about every 23 years. This is 1990 to the present time. Right, that's not either a lot nor a little. In the United States, between the end of World War II and 1973, electric power went up at 7 and 3 quarters percent per year compounded. Just amazing. In China, about the same uh, over the last 15 years. And then it, it levels off. And we're seeing a level off in China, but it, it'll still be growing. But still, you're going to have to build a new power system every quarter of a century. Right? That's huge. That's enormous. Uh, and people are doing that, and they're making a lot of money doing that. In fact, uh, as I was just saying, the head of uh, GE Power is a CMU graduate. It happens to be CIT, not Tepper. Uh, but uh, he came back and gave us a nice seminar here last year. So that's one pressure, is that people are increasing their use of electric power, partly because electricity is a preferred way of getting energy to end use. I'm probably not going to power that projector with natural gas directly, right? or coal. Um, you're probably not going to power this with a methane fuel cell. It's possible, but I think it's unlikely. Uh, electricity is a preferred fuel, and so we're seeing more and more shift into electric power. That electric power is increasing because of a bunch of reasons. One is population. Second is the increasing per capita use. Okay. Then I'm going to talk briefly about the shifts in fuels used for electric power. And I've alluded to that. And then one of the large changes which may happen, and that is concern over uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So population. These are the UN projections. This is actual. Notice this is a logarithmic scale. right? And so this is actual since the year 1000 AD. And it's been going up pretty rapidly. And these are various projections. We don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, this is actual data, the last global census about in 2000. And you know, it, it may peak in the middle of the century. It may actually go down. It may go up uh, continuously. We don't know. But we do know that that's a huge pressure on the amount of energy use, right? Now, per capita use. This is per capita use since 1970 in the United States. Uh, and it's gone up. And recently, it's leveled off. It turns out it's not because of you using less electric power or the big box stores using less electric power. It's because industrial power use in this country has stagnated since 1994. It's exactly the same today as it was in 1994. Uh, and that has. Uh, helped this curve go pretty well flat and, of course, decreased during the recession. Uh, the EU still going up a bit, the recession aside. Uh, this is the world in general. And here's China. You know, we talk about China and India in one phrase. They're very different, totally different in uh, energy use and in uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well. So I tend to talk to my friends in the press and they say, you know, it's, we don't have time to talk about it. I said, well, then you better talk just about China, because India is really very different. I spent a lot of time in India uh, talking to their electric power people. But you can see in the per capita use, it's just increasing. Well, this country has a lot of capitas, right? So that's putting a lot of pressure on, uh, on energy use. These are the fuels uh, used in electric power changed over you know, about 40 years, 1973 to, 19, to 2010. And there are some things that haven't changed much, coal and peat, but other things that have changed enormously. Natural gas, and this was before the shale gas boom, about doubled, right? Oil went down by about a factor of five. Where's oil? Here's oil for use electric power. Uh, and nuclear increased by about a factor of four. So over a moderately short period of time, you get these very large changes indeed. Okay, Right. So now the pressure about greenhouse gases. Let me talk now about the US, where I have some decent data. 
in the United States, electric power is now responsible for about 40% of all greenhouse gas emissions. When I was born in 1949, you know, it was, it was tiny, maybe 9% uh, debt, well, 11% down here. Uh, and 40% is a big portion of, of uh, our greenhouse gas emissions. And more to the point, it's much more cost effective to have controls at scale than it is on, let's say, your car uh, or a, uh, a small uh, combined heat and power plant that Carnegie Mellon might put in. Right? And so that's why the electric power sector is the target in many countries of greenhouse gas control. And the electric power sector hasn't been doing very well at all in increasing our energy efficiency, decreasing our greenhouse gas. This is the emission of CO2 in tons per megawatt hour. And this is, you know, I was born in 1949, and it was, you know, 0.83 or something, and now it's about, um, you know, 0.55 or so. That's not a big change over my lifetime. It really isn't. Despite the introduction of nuclear, despite the introduction of renewables, despite the enormous increase in efficiency of coal plants, despite the introduction of natural gas plants that uh, emit about half the CO2 as coal does per megawatt hour. Not a very enviable record. Right. Which is why people in many countries have been pushing for non-carbon emitting power. And I could talk maybe next time you're here for a reunion, I'll talk about low carbon uh, possibilities for fossil fuel. And we could talk about even taking CO2 directly from the air, even though it's only about 400 uh, parts per million. We can take it directly out of the air, and actually at, at uh, prices that are less than some of what we're paying for things like low carbon fuel standards. But today I want to talk about um, why we decarbonize the electric power sector in many countries uh, due to renewables and what the characteristics of those renewables are. Again, electric generation is going up, maybe stagnant uh, now for a bunch of reasons or maybe just for the recession, but it's going up quite a lot. And we may have enormous demand growth in the United States depending on whether this is long term or not. If I fit a simple line to the trend, remember seven and three quarters percent increasing up to the 73 oil embargo, it's been linear since then, I still get almost half again demand growth by 2030. That's not very long from now. Right? Okay. This is what we're making our power out of um, coal. This is 2011, so it's down now uh, to about 40 percent. Natural gas is up. Nuclear is about 20 percent. Hydroelectric power about 8 percent. Wind about 3 percent. The rest in the noise, really. Okay, so that's what we make our electric power out of in the United States of America. Here we've done a lot of work on low carbon generation of power. Some of it uh, I'll talk about today, but a lot of it I don't have time to talk about. What I will talk about is our work on the characteristics of wind and solar power uh, that are interesting because they are both the fastest growing piece of our electric generation sector. In fact, the Solar Industries Association made a big deal this month of trumpeting the fact that last month there was only solar that was added to the grid. Nothing else happened to come onto the grid and we got a little bit of solar. It's, it's, you know, it's all solar all the time. Well, not quite, but it's still small numbers. You know. um, but there's no doubt that wind and solar generation are still the largest growing in the United States. Uh, and low carbon electric power, hydroelectric power, is the fastest growing in many parts of Europe. In Turkey, for example, uh, in Portugal, in Spain, uh, hydro, low carbon uh, electric power is growing. Okay, so let me show you uh, just some uh, you know, characteristic numbers, since you all associate with Tepper. Uh, this is total fossil fuels growth since 1950, and have grown a lot. This is nuclear. And this is total uh, renewables, okay? That's 30% uh, low carbon power. That's really surprising to most people. They don't realize that 30% of our power in the United States is generated low carbon because they leave out two things. They leave out hydroelectric power and they leave out nuclear power. Right? But it's 30%. That's a fairly big number. So 
When we talk about renewables, we're not talking about all of that. Generally, we don't talk about nuclear. We don't talk about conventional hydro. When people talk about renewables, it's just this little bit in here, and I've blown that up over here. Here's the growth since 2001 of wind. Geothermal has been pretty stable. Uh, wood is used not for cooking in the United States. Who knows what wood is used for in electric power in the United States? Anybody know? Anybody work for Georgia Pacific here? We have some graduates too. Wood is used primarily in the pulp and paper industry for cogeneration. It's what's called black liquor. It's, it's the stuff that you get out of the cellulose. And they use it to generate the power they need uh, in the pulp and paper mills, in the craft process. Right? So that's a big, uh, big amount. And there's other biomass used for some other things. And here's, here's solar. You almost can't see it. You've got to be really in the front to see that, right? Okay. So um, anyway. All right, so this is a pie chart of all of the renewables by the slices, but the numbers are the percentage of our, um, non, uh, of our total electric generation. Wind at 3.5% last year, uh, wood about a percent, geothermal about a half percent, solar actually, it's, it, I didn't put as many significant digits as I should have here uh, in the other biomass. Okay? So, characteristics. Here's wind. This is a picture I took uh, not too long ago. Uh, from a little airplane over uh, uh, Mill Valley, Pennsylvania. Not, it's about 35 miles from here. Looks beautiful, right? And the farmer is getting here about $3,000 a wind turbine per year for rent of these things. Um, it's now being bid up to about $15,000 in the Laurel Highlands, by the way. It's a good deal. Um, land use might not be so benign. Here's a guy that if um, he thought a little weed killer was good, a lot must be a lot better, all right? Okay, and this ridge doesn't look so good to his neighbors. Um, land use is really a problem for uh, non-hydro renewables, well, for hydro renewables as well. This is a plot from uh, some guys at Boston University of the total acres per megawatt hour required of, for various power sources, including the mining, including the uh, coal ash dumps and so forth and so on. Nuclear, coal, natural gas, photovoltaic, this is actually a little small for photovoltaic. It ought to be about 250 or so, but it's all right. Uh, all papers have errors. Wind, you know, it does take quite a bit of land, right? Uh, hydroelectric, a lot. And biomass, oh my God. If I wanted to coal fire one, I mean, biomass fire one unit of the Bruce Mansfield electric power plant that has three units, uh, out by the Pittsburgh airport with biomass, I'd need all of the biomass in Pennsylvania okay, for one 800 megawatt unit. So uh, just really a tough thing from land use. People who look with some care at the electrical engineering of wind power, as we do here, are quite convinced that from an electrical engineering standpoint, we can integrate a very large amount of wind power, certainly more uh, than 30% by energy of wind. But in my humble but correct opinion, <laughs> um, I think that the land use is going to limit wind power to probably something in the 20-25% range. And I say that not just on theoretical grounds, but we've seen it in Germany and Spain where public opposition has forced wind power offshore. Uh, they don't want any more industrial landscape onshore. Okay? Um, occasionally, these things fail badly. Here, this is in the Netherlands, right? And it's double failure, right? I mean, you get two failures in any kind of technology. You want to see that again? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. yeah. Um, it does have sound with it, yeah, but I didn't, I didn't plug the thing in over here. Right. So what happened was uh, the primary brake had failed. It's windy as heck that day. Uh, the uh, crew had gone up uh, hand over hand. There's no elevator. They'd gone up, uh, and while they were working on it, the secondary brake failed. So they skedaddled out of there, which is how they got this video. Right. Okay, it turns out that there, in the United States, there are very few land use controls on wind. It's all local. Vermont is the only state that I'm aware of, we did a paper on this, uh, that requires statewide a decommissioning fund for these things. What are they going to look like in 20, 25 years? Right? 
Um, maybe they'll get repowered, maybe they'll get abandoned, maybe they'll get sold to some mom and pop operator who won't properly care for them. The decommissioning funds uh, are really not substantial that people use at all. Right? So again, these things are all totally manageable, it's just we have to think about them uh, a little in advance. Okay. So another issue with wind is it's windy here. Do the people live here? People aren't stupid. <laughs> They're not going to live where it's windy, right? The people live, you know, here and here and here and so forth. So you got, if you're going to have wind in the windiest places, you need big transmission lines. They're really popular, right? See, show of hands on how many people want a transmission line on their land, okay? Um, it turns out that the time to construct transmission, here's a histogram of actual lines that a student of ours did a little while ago, and you know the mode is about five years, and then the long tail is out to 16 years to construct transmission lines. And these are the ones that got built, not the 90% of them that never got built. Right? And so the American Wind Energy Association was going around some years ago and saying, look, we need a transmission superhighway to take the wind from the windy areas to the great sucking sound in Washington, D.C., <coughs> let's say, to quote Ross Perot. Um, and that's just not going to happen. And so we've been going and saying, look, you ought to, uh, from an economic standpoint, build wind closer to load, except lower wind conditions, and you'll be much better off economically. And in fact, the American Wind Energy Association's new statements uh, encompass that, which we think is a, a positive uh, thing. Okay. All right, so let me show you some characteristics of wind power. It's smooth, no? <laughs> okay. So this is all the wind in Texas, I don't know, a couple of years ago. Um, and it, uh, it blows about a third of the time, basically. Or I shouldn't say that. Let me be precise. This is a Tepper audience. If you take the actual power generated, the integral under that curve, uh, and divide it by the nameplate capacity of the wind times the number of hours in a year, you get about a third. Okay? Um, it, it, there's some seasonal variations and so forth, but putting this into your refrigerator is not going to be good for the refrigerator, right? So you need to do a bunch of other things uh, to the power system. And it's different from integrating coal or natural gas or even geothermal power, which is steady, or certainly hydroelectric power, which while it's ups and downs, isn't quite like this, right? There's another issue with wind. Here is the load in Texas. Most of uh, people are not up at four or five in the morning. Um, they're cooking at their barbecue at uh, 6 p.m., right? Uh, or using other electric power there. The wind, on the other hand, blows like this. The correlation is like that, okay? So that's an issue. It doesn't mean that you can't use the wind. But in Hawaii, my friend Connie Lau, who is the chief operating officer of the Hawaii Electric Power Company, tells me where they, they have very high load factors for the wind. And, and remember, Texas was one third. Hawaii is about half. The name plate capacity get the trade winds. They actually have to curtail the wind turbines because they don't have the load to take it at night. The load goes down, the wind goes up, you know, so forth and so on. Seasonally, you've got the same problem. Here is Texas's load driven by what in the summer? AC, right, air conditioning. I lived there for 15 years. I ran my air conditioner a lot. Uh, the wind, on the other hand, blows most strongly in the spring and in the late fall, not so very much in the summer. Okay? These are not showstoppers, but they are things that you have to think about. Right? Okay. On a shorter time scale, this is the Pacific Northwest Bonneville Power uh, Administration area, a thousand wind turbines, okay? And um, the wind failed completely for about two weeks there in January of 2009. No wind at all. Big high pressure area sat over there. Wind didn't blow at all, right? And so whatever reserves that you have have to be able to take you through periods like this, okay? So, We've been doing uh, a bunch of work in a specific project here for the last three years, the so-called the Renewal Act project, here's our website. And one of the things that we started looking at was there had been some folks uh, who had done some arm waving, not good uh, science, and said, if you just connect the country together, all of the wind turbines in the whole country will just smooth out and you won't see any of what I just showed you. Okay? 
And there was a guy who uh, had a Scientific American cover story on this. There's a guy called Mark Z. Jacobson at uh, Stanford who has published many papers where he's asser asserted that, right? And he, uh, he's, he just put out another press release on it a couple of weeks ago. As a famous physicist said, Fermi, that isn't even wrong. It doesn't even rise to the level of being wrong. <laughs> right? So we did something unheard of in this field. We took some actual data. Right? So we took the mathematical characteristics of wind and solar power. Here's the wind. And I want to show you some of the things that we've learned here uh, that have brought your school to world prominence in this. Okay. So here's when I'm a physicist, so I look at a, um, uh, a time series like this, and I say, well, all right, what are the frequencies contained in that? How much low and high notes are there, right? So what's the character of these fluctuations? You know, bass notes and treble notes. This is the equalizer on your eye thingy, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, and so, you know, you get, you get low notes and high notes. So what are the low notes and the high notes in that? Well, you do a, a, a bunch of mathematical manipulation. It's not very hard, otherwise I couldn't do it. Uh, and you get the low notes here and the high notes here. Remarkably, the fluctuations at time scales of the order of a day are a thousand times larger than at time scales of the order of an hour or a minute. What that means is that you don't need a tremendous amount of very expensive, fast moving things to counteract the variability of wind. You can do it with existing natural gas or even coal plants. Okay, so that was the first thing we found. Uh, that got me stricken from the Christmas card lists of a lot of people who were trying to sell these fast moving sources, right? Okay. Um, in technical terms, it's not white noise. Okay, it's not a completely flat spectrum. So we looked at solar. It turns out solar is even more variable than wind. Why? Clouds. The clouds, these small clouds, they go across, you know, very quickly. And so this is a day of uh, what was then the largest solar array in the U.S. taken at, at 10 second resolution. And you can see the clouds going by, right? Um, again, at the long time scales, solar, except for night, which is a problem, uh, solar is uh, much more variable than at the short time scale. So you can counteract the variability of solar plants with existing fairly inexpensive uh, stuff that you have lying around your power system. Right. That's a good idea. All right, so let me come back to this question about connecting the whole country together and all these fluctuations go away. So we looked at the biggest uh, 20 power plants in Texas, mostly out in West Texas. Again, people aren't stupid enough to live where the wind blows strong, right? Here's Houston, where I lived for 15 years in Dallas. So we took a look at these power spectra. Here's a single one. Here's four of them, here's 20 of them. And what you find is that at short time scales, this is a few minutes, um, the hooking of them together actually does decrease the fluctuations by about a factor of 10. That's a good thing. But it matters what the time scale is that you're talking about. At the time scales where the fluctuations are strongest, about a day, a few tens of hours, it doesn't help at all. Yeah, maybe a factor of two. Now, because we're in the Tepper School, we ask, where is the point of diminishing returns? Technical terms, where's the first order condition? So we look at these and we plot curves that say, I connect these number of wind plants together. We can do it with all the pairs of those 20. And here's the fluctuations at 12 hours. We can get about half of those out. Six hours, one hour, you can get about 95% of the fluctuations out. But look at this. The point of diminishing returns is reached here at very few, a handful, uh, you know, half a dozen at most wind plants. So connecting all the wind plants you want together is not cost effective as it turns out. And we did the same thing at larger scales. Here's the whole country, all the wind plants in the country connecting them together. We did the same kind of work. And you know, this is the Texas one. This is a duration curve. The point is that 
you can connect these things together and you don't actually uh, smooth out the fluctuations that are expensive to, um, uh, to counteract the, the uh, big ones that are a thousand times more than the short ones. So that's a good news because it means you don't have to build this transmission superhighway. That uh, the last time I looked was something over a hundred billion dollars of investment that people were talking about for this transmission superhighway and of course people were very upset about it. Uh, the government had passed in the Energy Policy Act of 2005 some eminent domain legislation that people were very upset about to build this transmission superhighway and when this research came out people said oh, we don't really need to do that and, and everybody except for the lawyers breathed a big sigh of relief. They consider that an annuity, fighting that for years. There we are. Okay. So let me talk just a bit about solar, because if you go out to the person on the street, they will say the solution to the energy crisis, if they don't live in western Pennsylvania where the solution is natural gas, the solution to the energy crisis is solar, right? Most people will tell that to you if you, if you just, you know, strike up a conversation in uh, uh, a bar or a supermarket checkout line. So we looked at solar. Here's what was then the biggest solar array in the country, and this is what it looks like from the air. Uh, notice, by the way, their publicity photo, it has clouds in it, okay, right? Um, this is what it looks like on a, a clear day. You know, it's a cosine squared curve, goes up, noon, comes back down. This is the very next day, okay? Uh, this is a 10 minute res or one minute resolution, and this is that curve I showed you before, 10 second resolution, right? Um, but there is a technology called solar thermal where you have these big silvery troughs. They're putting one in in Turkey, although you think it may not be going in. May, I, I, didn't hear about it. Okay, I think, I think it is going in and, and um, there's a very large one where you, uh, you focus the light from the sunlight, uh, sorry, you focus the sunlight onto a black tube containing a fluid, uh, oil of some type, that you heat up and you put that into a heat exchanger, it makes steam and so forth. Well, that oil, that working fluid, has some thermal inertia. And so we thought, well, you know, that's going to have the ability to smooth out some of these thermal fluctuations that you see in, uh, in the uh, solar photovoltaic. And indeed, when we did the math on that and took the actual data from this, we found that the costs of integrating solar photovoltaic are about $10 a megawatt hour, that's uh, in terms that I understand about one cent per kilowatt hour, whereas for solar thermal it's about the same thing as wind, about a half a cent per kilowatt hour. Okay? To put that in perspective, wind power costs uh, about seven cents unsubsidized uh, per kilowatt hour. So a half a cent is neither a little nor a lot, whereas for solar it costs quite a bit more but this is quite a bit more. And for solar, it's about 20% um, of the total cost of the power. Okay. Whereas for wind, it's about 10%. And that's because, and, or for solar thermal. Now the problem is solar thermal is now a bit more expensive than even solar photovoltaic. And although solar photovoltaic has dropped precipitously, as oversupply has caused the factories to just push this stuff out uh, the door to try and not go out of business, it's still way more expensive than wind, a factor of uh, about three more expensive than wind. Okay? So we've been doing a lot of work on wind because that's where a lot of the renewables are, and we found some uh, interesting things with wind forecasts, uh, and we now have a simple mathematical model to improve the wind forecasts. Uh, in, in fact, considerably improve the forecasts over a day ahead. Uh, and we're now, we've published, uh, we've submitted that paper and we've told it to most of the wind forecast folks and they say, oh wow, that's amazing. And so we think that by forecasting uh, a little better, you can dramatically reduce the costs of integrating wind. So that's good. Um, we also now understand, because we know the forecast errors pretty well, how much you're going to have to put other generation other than the wind, on retainer. For a day ahead basis, there's going to be some irreducible uncertainty in the wind forecast. And we've now quantified exactly what that means in two areas of the country with most wind called Texas and the Midwest. These are all the wind plants there. And so 
you know, right now we're down, well, in Texas we're about 10% wind generation. But, you know, at 20 or 30%, we now know how much additional generation you're going to have to put on retainer, which you have to pay for, in day ahead. And it goes up, uh, you know, pretty linearly. Most people have just thrown up their hands at this problem, but we were able to solve that, I think, quite nicely. And that's, that's been very useful in both um, telling people, you know, you don't have to be as scared as some people uh, told you you would be about the reserves, these retainer things that you need. Um, and on the other hand, the wind advocates have been underestimating the amount. So that's what we try and do. Okay, hydroelectric power. That's what, what you do in Turkey, right? In this country, I don't know about in Turkey, it has droughts. We have about one big drought and one small drought in the U.S. every decade. And this is the actual generation we're building new hydroelectric here. But in the steady state, get one big drop uh, and one small drop or two every decade in that. So we ask the question, are you going to have droughts in wind power? Hmm? And the answer appears uh, to be, yeah, but there are kind of half the level that you see in hydroelectric power. We took the airport data, there's not enough wind data to go back 40 years that you need for these statistics. So we took the airport uh, anemometer data uh, for the windy parts of the United States, and these were places where we had good data sets. You know, there's an old joke. There's no data set horrible enough that an economist won't use it, right? <laughs> okay. There are actually some data here and here that were so horrible we didn't use it, okay? But we were able to roughly estimate what the wind power would be uh, over the last 40 years. And this is the plot I just showed you, normalized to one, the hydroelectrics up and down. And here's what we estimate the wind power would do. And yeah, they're windier years and not so windy years, but it's not quite as bad as what we see for hydroelectric power. Okay? So it'll be there, it'll happen. But, but maybe not quite as big. All right, the last thing I want to talk to you about is there's no free lunch. When you put in a certain amount of wind power, or solar for that matter, you would think, suppose I put in, um, you know, 50% uh, of all my electricity was wind power. You would think I would drop all of my emissions, let's say, of CO2 by half. Not so. When you are countering those fluctuations, with other plants, natural gas plant or coal plant, there's two things that happen. First, you have to have that plant turning over at idle, just like idling your car uh, at a uh, stop sign. And the second is when it's ramping up and down, it turns out it has poor gas mileage. Just like when I was learning how to drive, I was all over the accelerator and all over the gas pedal, and my gas mileage was horrible. It's the same thing for a generator if you're ramping it up and down. Okay. Um, and so we looked at that in detail for both natural gas plants and coal plants. If the coal plants are compensating for that variability, you get about 90% of the expected variation. Interestingly enough, these clean natural gas plants, you only get about 80% of the expected gain in pollution control. And that's because you can't decrease the power output at idle of most natural gas plants as far as you can for a coal plant, the flame goes out. Whereas with a coal plant, you can just cook it along at very minimum uh, amount of uh, heat output. And so the idle emissions from the uh, coal plants are less than the natural gas. Okay, the last thing was offshore. Remember I told you that land use is likely to be a serious impediment here. And they've pushed wind offshore in Europe. In the US, you have something you don't have in Europe, hurricanes, okay? And so we looked at what happens if you put these wind turbines in harm's way. And the answer is, in the Gulf Coast, in Florida, it's a horrible place to put them. There's some serious risk. On the other hand, Sandy accepted, uh, if you put them up the U.S. East Coast, like the Cape Winds uh, plant here, it's not so bad. So where are they building them? Well, Cape Winds, you know about right here is where they're building them. So we looked at what the chances are that these things will be destroyed before you have a chance to rebuild them. And if anybody's in the reinsurance business, I got a paper I'd like to give you. <laughs> right. okay. Finally, we said, where should you put the wind power? Should you put it in the windiest places? Where should you put the solar power? Should you put it in the sunniest places? Depends on your objective function. 
If your objective function is reducing pollution, you should put it right here, where we have the biggest coal plant pollution from uh, all down the Ohio River, really, and into the mountains of, uh, of Pennsylvania. If you put in uh, wind, the annual health and environmental benefits from displaced SO2, nitrous oxide, and particulate matter, not even the CO2, right here in the Ohio Valley and upper Midwest. Uh, this is solar, same place. I was wrong about something. My friend Gene Fox, who was the head of the New Jersey Public Utility Commission uh, and her governor, forced through a huge mandate for solar power in New Jersey, and I laughed at her. I was wrong. This is why I was wrong. Uh, in fact, even though, how many of you went to school here? Some of you married in, right. So Pittsburgh is the sunniest place you've ever been? <laughs> yeah, right. Even here, solar makes sense. It's just counterintuitive. We have an 11% capacity factor for solar if it comes down in price. And wind certainly makes sense. All right. So again, final comments. Integration of wind or solar is going to use a portfolio of stuff. Some of it really slow, like coal or gas plants. Some of it really fast, like batteries. Right? Um, the amount of smoothing, if you interconnect the whole country together, is very dependent on the time scale that you consider. Large connections don't really make a lot of sense. There's going to be drought years and not such drought years for hydro. The same is true for wind. Uh, and although the solar thermal stuff is currently fairly high cost compared even to photovoltaic, it's going to be about half the cost to integrate that uh, as, um, as photovoltaic. So if the costs come down, that's something worth considering. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, these kind of things. Let me turn on um, the, uh, uh, the lights and uh, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. I noticed you had offshore on the like, Atlantic and the Gulf Coast. Yeah, yeah. I didn't see anything for the Great Lakes and the Lower Great Lakes. Yeah, we don't have any uh, hurricanes there, so we weren't interested in looking at those. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, you know, there are some bad storms, uh, but they're probably no worse than the storms in Northern Europe where people do have data. And, and by the way, so the, the um, results of that were we said, look, the grid codes ought to do a couple of things for offshore wind turbines. One was strengthen them. Uh, and the other is it turns out there's a great reduction in the risk. If you just take the nacelle that's on the top of it and point it into the wind, well, of course, they move to follow the wind anyway. But they move on off-grid power, as it turns out, or on, on grid power, I should say. So in a hurricane, the grid power is likely to be down. So we recommend that they have on-site storage so they can yaw into the wind and follow the uh, hurricane winds as they go through. Yes, sir? One of the things I always thought about electrical generation is the storage of power was always a great problem. Right. What are we doing here to, in that field? The best battery company I know of is a CMU spinoff. Aquion Energy, A-Q-U-I-O-N. Uh, Jay Whitaker, who was a person that Granger Morgan and I recruited here from Caltech's Jet Propulsion Lab, had done the batteries on the Mars rovers. He came here six months after he came here. He patented a battery. He said, if we're going to do grid storage, it's got to be cheap. It's got to be dirt cheap because it's got to compete with uh, pumped hydroelectric storage. We've used most of the sites for that. So dirt cheap. Let me think. Oh, I'll make it out of dirt. So his electrodes are carbon, charcoal. Uh, it's doped with sodium. And the electrolyte is basically seawater. And the first money in was Kleiner Perkins. Uh, they're now, they did a mezzanine round. They've got a uh, $100 million factory that uh, is going to be operational in June out in the old Sony plant in Westmoreland County. Great company. And I think uh, they will achieve easily their target of getting to $300 a kilowatt hour, which is about the same as pumped hydro storage. Uh, they're already selling a product. Oops, sorry. Probably made a big noise in your earphones. Sorry. Um, they are uh, uh, selling their prototypes to off-grid solar installations and they're performing pretty well. So yeah, I'm quite high on that. 
Yes? Uh, your statistics and your analysis, is that just industrial scale, or does it call, also include generate place, small wind? Oh, small wind? It's a joke. <coughs> Don't <laughs> buy it. There was a great test that was done a few years ago where they took the, the 12 biggest s smelling <laughs> selling small wind, <laughs> uh, and they put them out for a year in a pretty windy area. First of them, all nine of them lasted the year, right? Uh, and their capacity factors generally were between a third and a, and a quarter of what the manufacturers said they would be. Um, they were all very noisy, not a good idea. Small solar, on the other hand, can be a good idea, especially in places where, you know, I don't believe in subsidies in general. But if I was a homeowner, I could take the subsidy. Uh, and you can, in the highest cost areas, California, Hawaii, uh, Puerto Rico, you can certainly generate solar power for what the grid power is if you have a large house. California has, the, how many Californians do we have here? Right. So what do you pay for your electricity? A lot. A lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is temporal. We're supposed to be quantitative. <laughs> They have an inclined block structure, right? You pay, it's a, it's a reverse quantity discount. You pay more for if you have a McMansion than if you have a hull, right? And, and so the last block, if I remember right, is about 38 cents a kilowatt hour. 40 cents, 40 cents. Uh, and, and that's just the supply charge, right? You have the distribution on top of that. Uh, my supply charge is seven cents, okay? So at that point, yeah, you can, you can beat that with solar. Yes, sir? How did you determine your variability costs? OK, so what we did was we took the time series that we, uh, we saw, not the frequency domain, but the time domain, and we said, all right, what's the compensation you need? And we broke it into three things, the energy, the hourly component, and the faster, which is called load following component. Those are all priced in the market. In California, we just looked up what the prices were, and we, we integrated that. And that's how we got it. it. You know, it was a lot of computation, and we had to verify the model, but it was straightforward. Yes, sir? How much more of a decline do you see in solar efficiency? Oh, the it, cost? okay, so the solar efficiency is an interesting question. Uh, let me come back to that. The, uh, I'll get to that after I answer the cost question. The cost for solar panels have been going down quite sharply. They will, in my estimation, they're going to reach bottom this year or next, and then they'll go back up. Why? The, well, no, what's going to happen is that the factories that are now selling at or below cost are, are going to go out of business. China's going to keep buying. China is going to keep buying, but they, uh, they are consolidating in their factories as well. Germany's maybe not going to keep buying, but the Chinese factories, um, uh, let's see, I think there were, there were 16 operating a year ago, and there's seven at the moment, right? And so, you know, when they get the supply sector straightened out, there's not going to be this price war that there is now. So I think now's the time to buy solar in the next year or so, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to gradually go back up. Um, efficiency. If you read the press releases and so forth, you'll find people trumpeting these, you know, 49% efficient solar cells, which they get for a nanosecond in the lab, but never mind. Efficiency matters for only one thing. It doesn't matter for utility scale solar at all, because the land is so incredibly cheap that it might as well be free. It's the lawyers that are expensive just to get the permits and so forth. But the land is almost free. It does matter if you're trying to put it on your home because you've got a fixed area or on your business. Uh, and there, again, there's a big break point between the cost and the efficiency. And the best ones seem to be in the high teens at the moment. That, that's the knee of the curve. Time for maybe well, one more. We're, no, we're actually we're, out of time. Out of time. Oh, OK. Thank you right. very much, Dr. Rapp, for a great presentation great. today. We love Thanks, Dr. John. Rapp. He travels and speaks for our alumni communities around the world. So you'll, we just began the discussion today, but there's lots more. Thank you so much. Our next session begins in four minutes. So you can either stay here and Dr. Jeffrey Gallick will be talking on how to stay happy with what you have. Or if you want to, if you're in the strategy area and you want to learn how to maximize uh, your competitive advantage, Dr. Jeffrey Williams, who many of you have, is going to be down in 153. Thank you very much. You've got uh, four minutes. Thank you. Thank you.